I had two obsessions in my childhood, animation and video games. Always greater than the urge to consume was the urge to create. Animation made sense. You draw one picture after another and then sequence them all together to create the illusion of motion. Rolf Harris taught me that. I could even make my own in little notepads. But how on earth were video games made? It just seemed like sorcery as far as I was concerned, until I happened upon a mysterious piece of software called the Games Factory. And so began my first digital creative outlet as a maker of edgy and disgusting games. Wait, hold on. Why aren't you subscribed to my channel? Come on. Long-time PC gamers may remember that before there were Flash games, there were Click and Play games. Welcome to the wonderful world of Click and Play. With Click and Play, full game development was finally accessible to non-coding simpletons like me. Before long, I'd worked out the basics of the software and was making stupid little games to amuse my friends. Removing most of the complex programming from game creation in favour of a simplified event editor, the Games Factory allowed me to get straight to business drawing sprites and backgrounds and not getting bogged down in syntax and complex mathematics. I would make games about my friends, about murderers and what I assumed taking drugs was like. There was absolutely no limit to what depths of depravity my themes dare sink to. Join me as we take a journey through my teenhood. Edgelord alert! Although many of you will still declare me Lord of the Edge for my dirty beetle nasties, Ricky Jackson parodies and this Jerry Jackson moment, that is nothing compared to what I was in my mid-teens. Though subtlety hadn't quite been introduced to my repertoire at the time. Add to that my obsession with, at the time, brand new show South Park don't belittle my people, you fucking and you have quite the recipe for a lot of utterly needless swearing. Sheep Wars. Do you like being insulted? Do you like blood and poo? Then Sheep Wars is for you. My first serious game project, which I sneakily distributed via CDR when making entirely legal copies of PC games for friends at school. Pre-internet, you'd play any game you could get your hands on. It was very normal to get a copy of Duke Nukem and find five or six other games on the CD in folders. I sometimes wonder how many people ended up installing my game abominations whilst trying to install Half-Life. Well, that's just rude. Even the menus weren't safe from this teenage vulgarian. It was an all-out profanity assault. Perhaps Ole Gunnar Solskjaer's side-scrolling platformer debut. Sheep Wars was repetitive, infuriating, vulgar, and due to my ignorance regarding graphical limitations, ran horribly on hardware at the time. Games just don't throw in a random Egypt level like they used to. Home, of course, to the Weto's professor. Weto! and these smooth pyramids. Mel Gibson's Safari. Welcome to Mel Gibson's Safari 3. Mel Gibson is the protagonist here. On Safari, it would seem, avoiding rocks, fighting natives, and killing elephants, as he typically does. There's a strong possibility my friend Christian provided the concept for this one. It's hard to remember that far back, but it sounds like one of his. We would occasionally think of ideas for hypothetical games with no intention of creating them, such as Overdraft 98, in which you must manage your finances, and The Washing Machine Emulator. Washing machine? Yay! By today's standards, these are completely feasible, if trivial, game concepts, but 25 years ago, it was laughable to imagine such games could ever exist. Mel Gibson's Safari, 3 considers the possibility that 1 and 2 already exist, and so, just to be safe, jumps straight to a third instalment. Roughly aiming to look like a low-quality NES game, I really wanted people to think this was genuine. I even credited it to the fictitious Mart Poom, who, in reality, was a goalkeeper for Derby County in 1997, and a fabricated backstory about it originally being for the Scorpion 8 system, which, as far as I know, was simply a bootleg Nintendo system that that had no original games. Better look next time, mate. Christian accurately provided the voice of Mel Gibson, who'd do his best to help you avoid the enemies and guide you through the safari. Watch it for that one, mate. 
This one made an appearance in Burnt Face Man 5, where he reviewed it, giving it three panels out of five, and my own personal hooray! <laughs> Psycho Bitch Killer was me at my most edgy. A game with no enemies, just one man and a chainsaw. Killing small children, a bleeding man hanging from a tree, and the Joracel Bunny? This was directly inspired by a game I saw some kids playing at school on the Acorn computers, one lunchtime when the teachers weren't looking, around 1993. Right at the height of the hysteria surrounding video game violence. Like the Grinch who stole Christmas, these violent video games threatened to rob this particular holiday season of a spirit of goodwill. I had no idea what I was looking at, but it was incredibly gory and excited my 10-year-old brain. It's hard to describe why young me was so excited by video game violence, but I knew I needed to make some of my own messed up stuff. Even at the time, I knew this was a bit much. I just wanted to make something shocking. I'm glad I grew out of that phase. Every one of these boxes has a naughty word written on it. That's where I was. The mission seems to have been to murder 25 victims, but with only seven or eight killable NPCs to find, that is where this game sadly ends. Not to be confused with my other games from the same period, Bitchmobile and Bitch Slayer, which includes this moment. You're gonna die, you fucking fool. Going through CDs of old creations is indeed a cringe fest. There is a good reason why my cartoons from this period aren't available to watch. John 64 was inspired by a friend from school who'd kick you in the back, shouting out some nonsensical word in the process. A very young smoker, he was also the best at flicking pen into the bin due to his long fingers. I am not making this up. He'd shout out words to accompany the pen flicking too. Conversion. Like flippant, helicopter, and also. Sweeter. My friend Jimmy did the voice for this game with a flawless impersonation. Hey, Big Billy Trek. This is another game absolutely full of references from school. In fact, every Black. single aspect of this game is based on something that actually happened. Boom pop. I skipped straight to the sequel on this one because nobody remembers the original. Inspired again by asking my friend Christian for a title for a game and then attempting to make it. He probably spent all of two seconds thinking of the title and then I spent two months trying to make it. You play as Hugh Laurie. Actor turned firefighter in Northern Ireland, possibly based on a hypothetical movie we'd imagined in which Hugh, deep in the Irish troubles, mostly extinguishes fires, collects BAFTAs, and gets into scrapes with the local Irish natives. It lasts not a single level and contains many unignorable glitches, including these numbers all over the screen, because I didn't fully understand how values were supposed to be stored, so I just put them where you could see them. I didn't give up on this one, I just lost all the files in a hard drive failure because I was a no backup cowboy. Many developers and enthusiasts with short attention spans will agree that starting new games is a lot more fun and easier than finishing existing projects. The majority of my games simply stop, sometimes in the middle of a level, but most often at the start of level two. Mel Gibson's Safari took the novel approach of fabricating a fake crash partway through the first level, preventing any further progress. <laughs> Most of my games were made before 2003, the year I went to university. There, I found myself making cartoons and music in my free time rather than games. Then, unexpectedly, in 2004, animation became my full-time job following the release of Salad Fingers and has been ever since. I never gave up completely though. During lockdown, I dusted off the old Game Maker, which at this point had become Click Team Fusion, and started making something new an as yet untitled, somewhat ambient, moody adventure slash exploration game in which you are lost in the moors amongst birds, ants, fire-spitting apes, and a lingering sense of doom. Not only that, but also this Jerry Jackson game I've been working on. 
which began as a spiritual successor to John 64, but has since evolved into an action-adventure game and is quite deep in development, currently a whole four levels long, has bosses, story, dialogue, multiple modes, and plenty of unnecessary violence. I am the one true god. You have not seen the last of me. This is not an advert, by the way. These are not coming soon. I have no intention of quitting, but who knows what's going to happen. I made the mistake once of announcing something. Never again. But who knows? We'll see. So that was a small look at the video games I made when I was younger. A couple of the games on this video are available to play online. I wouldn't recommend it. You've seen enough here. However, I would recommend going over to saladfingersstore.com and having a look at our selection of merchandise.